On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including the FAA publishes environmental assessment for Starbase, NASA options more Dragon crew flights for the ISS, a new UFO panel hopes to shed some light on aerial phenomena, CRS-25 delayed due to a potential fuel leak, and Astra's first tropics launch fails to reach orbit. There's a lot to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. The FAA published their final programmatic environmental assessment for SpaceX's Starbase launch facility in Boca Chica, Texas on Monday, and folks, it's good news. The long-awaited assessment has returned a finding of no specific impact, meaning that provided SpaceX complies with the mitigation listed in the PEA, they will not need an environmental impact survey before being considered for a launch license from Starbase. The list of 75 mitigations are stipulations that SpaceX has to adhere to, or things they have to change with their site and procedures. The PEA also states the scope of proposed operations should SpaceX pass the mitigation steps and get a license. We have listed 150 seconds of Starship static fire test, 135 seconds of super heavy static fire test, five Starship suborbital launches, day or night, five super heavy launches, day or night, 10 Starship land landings, day or night, and five super heavy land landings, day or night. Starship obviously gets more landings to accommodate for the suborbital hops, likely done without a super heavy booster, but this confirms what we've all been figuring. Starbase is a testing facility, and SpaceX doesn't intend to do regular launches from there yet. These numbers were likely shaped while SpaceX and the FAA were going back and forth about mitigations brought on by the study. Most of the mitigations are in response to areas of concern found in that study, everything from potential air and water contamination to damaging sonic booms, blinding light caused by engine flares, and even socioeconomic impact to nearby marginalized communities as a result of area shutdowns due to testing. These mitigations are things like the FAA pledging to hold SpaceX accountable to damage suffered to nearby homes from any sonic booms, or the construction of a water tower for the needs of the facility. SpaceX will also have to cancel a planned desalination plant because it would impact a nesting ground for sea turtles. The study itself is extremely thorough, and it's clear the extra time spent since the draft of this PEA in September of last year was well spent. For example, with the water resources part of the assessment, it wasn't just pollution the study focused on. Disturbances from construction, runoff and water discharges on site, potential effect on nearby wetlands from tremors created during testing, very thorough stuff. Some folks might be tempted to see this report as yet another block. It's important to note that SpaceX has spent the intervening time getting up to shape for these mitigations. They've been in constant communication with the FAA and have been negotiating with them. You can see it in their proposals, dropping the desalination plant and the natural gas pretreatment system they were going to install. The FAA also worked with six federal agencies, two state agencies, and five local indigenous tribes to gather data and take suggestions on restrictions. SpaceX doesn't see a launch license until all of these stipulations are reached, so when SpaceX President Gwen Shotwell predicted a late July launch, she was likely much closer to the mark. It won't take SpaceX long to comply with the mitigations, especially since most of them are stipulating the acceptance of responsibility to act, patrol, repay damages, or not build something. All this to say, Boca Chica is looking ready for some launches, space fans. We're in the final stretch. All we need to do is be patient just a little longer. NASA has announced that they are preparing to fill out their remaining ISS crew flights with five more SpaceX Dragon capsules and maybe more if Starliner has any more issues. The notice of intent to purchase at least five extra flights of the Falcon 9 propelled Crew Dragon vehicles 
was quietly released on June 1st, which updated the itinerary all the way to the projected end-of-life date for the ISS sometime in spring 2030. The current plan is balanced around SpaceX flights taking the spring launches and, provided nothing else goes wrong with Starliner, Boeing taking the fall launches, with the exception of fall 2029. NASA really wants to stick to their plan for alternating providers to allow for extra redundancy, which is why, should Starliner stick the landing with its next couple of tests, we could see one more change to the schedule, with Boeing taking over the fall 2029 launch. The notice of intent isn't a completed order, so of course everything is still just in planning, but it's got to sting a bit for the Starliner team to have their capsule see so little use comparatively. The extra preparations for more Dragon launches is a mark of how well the vehicle and its Falcon 9 rocket have performed for the ISS crew program, while Boeing was stuck in the weeds trying to get Starliner working. Redundancy is a NASA mantra for a reason, it would seem. The other implication of this story is that the end-of-life date for the ISS is getting more solidified. The station, which was adapted from the planned MIR-2 Russian station, has been doing research in low Earth orbit since 2000, which means there are a bunch of 22-year-olds running around who have never known a time without humans in space. That's a huge achievement, and even though there will be several other stations, commercial and otherwise, in orbit around the Earth and Moon by 2030, it'll still be an emotional day when the ISS signs off for the last time. Don't call them UFOs. NASA is attempting to remove the stigma of studying the sensationalized subject by renaming them Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, or UAPs. Included in the June 9th announcement was the formation of a panel to investigate UAP in response to the dearth of reports and information that has been released by many civilian and government sources. The panel will conduct a $100,000 nine-month study whose focus will be not to just identify data on the phenomena reported, but to look into how best to collect data in the future. The hope according to Associate Administrator for Science at NASA, Thomas Zerbukin, is to take a field that is relatively data poor and make it into a field that is much more data rich and therefore worthy of scientific investigation and analysis. Like the Department of Defense, NASA has an obvious vested interest in studying aerial phenomena, something that the murky and often fantastical nature of UFO reporting certainly doesn't help with. It makes sense that NASA would want to step into this space to add some actual scientific scrutiny. But to do that, the agency is going to have to set up some sort of standardized system which will give some guidance on the collection of reports and evidence of the phenomena. Of course, one of the biggest barriers to this work is the stigma of simply talking about UAP at all. NASA heads note that in the May 17th congressional hearings on UFOs, one of the oft-cited reasons for aviation officials not coming forward with UFO sightings was the prospect of being branded a conspiracy nut, a potential career-ending label for someone in that industry. NASA hopes that with their name behind this study and a vetted procedure for identifying genuine reports, this stigma will slowly vanish and we'll finally get some hard scientific data on any potential visitors in our skies. But what do you think? Is NASA wasting their time, or is this something we should be spending our money on? Sound off in the comments below. SpaceX's next cargo mission to the ISS, CRS-25, is being postponed due to a possible fuel leak discovered during its preparations for a launch that was scheduled this week. While getting topped up in the bay, SpaceX techs noticed elevated vapor readings in an isolated area of the vehicle propulsion system. The vapor was monomethyl hydrazine, MMH, one of the two main propellants used in the 16 Draco thrusters that allow Dragon to maneuver. While the exact source of the readings hasn't yet been identified, crews rightfully took no chances and offloaded the fuel and oxidizer from the area as a precaution. 
MMH works by mixing with an oxidizer, in this case nitrogen tetroxide, causing a controlled reaction that produces thrust. This happens just by mixing, so SpaceX crews were justifiably quick to get any reactable substances away once the vapor was detected. As for when we can expect CRS-25 to be rescheduled, NASA released a statement saying, once the exact source of the elevated readings is identified and causes determined, the joint NASA and SpaceX teams will determine and announce a new target launch date. NASA Mission Control reportedly told the station crew that the new target date would be no earlier than June 28th, so they'll have to wait for that 4,500 pound top up on snacks and science experiments. We've had a few examples this season of testing procedures catching potentially dangerous issues, which is a good thing. It's easy to forget why we need lengthy inspections and reports when we never get examples of what we have them for, which is something for us to keep in mind the next time a launch gets delayed for safety reasons. Disaster struck NASA's first tropic satellite launch on Sunday as Astra's LV-0010 failed to reach orbital velocity and took its two CubeSat payload down with it. Things were looking good after a smooth launch at about 1.43pm EDT from a pad at the Cape Canaveral space station, but about 7 minutes into the flight, the second stage booster shut off prematurely. The Tropics mission is meant to launch three pairs of tropical storm monitoring satellites. With an orbital time frame of six hours or so, this would allow NASA to monitor storms every hour and keep a much more accurate eye on things. This isn't the end of the mission by any stretch, there are at least two more launches that could succeed, but not only is this an unfortunate loss for a program that could help save lives, but it's also Astra's second failed mission this year, and fifth loss out of the company's seven venture class rockets. Astra often touts the extremely cheap construction of their rockets, and their goal is to produce them so cheaply that they can launch them at a quick cadence at the cost of reusability. But that seems to be leading to an alarming failure rate. NASA's Tropics mission is paying Astra almost $8 million for the three launches, and a further $32 million for designing, testing, and sifting through the CubeSat data. And even though this loss must sting, NASA Associate Administrator for Science Thomas Zerbukin seems to think the riskiness of the mission is worth it even with the loss, saying, quote, even though we are disappointed right now, we know there is value in taking risks in our overall NASA science portfolio because innovation is required for us to lead. It might take some time to figure out exactly what went wrong with the LV-0010 second stage, but with the other two launches of Tropics slated for the end of July, they had better move quickly. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.